الخير نرحب بجميع متابعينا في اليوم الخامس من أسبوع العلوم العربي أكبر احتفالية افتراضية للعلوم والتكنولوجيا في الوطن العربي المستمرة حتى 23 أغسطس تحت شعار رؤى مستقبلية ضمن فعاليات اليوم سوف تقدم الدكتورة علياء أبو كيوان حديث بعنوان علم فوق الجينات في الصحة والمرض بعدها الوقاية خير من العلاج مع أستاذ محسن الخديسي عن قناع واقي من الكوفيد 19 ثم يأتي موعدنا مع الجلسة النقاشية بعنوان ثلاث دوائر للعالمات تدور حول تمثيل المرأة في العلوم في جميع أنحاء العالم وبعدها سوف يعرفنا دكتور شفيق تعيلب على تكنولوجيا الأقوار الصناعية وتطبيقاتها ويعطينا بعدها أستاذ ستيف رايان رؤية مستقبلية لدور الجيل القادم في دعم البحث العلمي ثم نختم فعاليات اليوم الرابع بكبسولة سارة حواس تحت عنوان كيف يؤثر الضغط النفسي على صحتك النفسية بعد اكتشاف كوفيد آه بعد الاكتشاف الفعال لسارس كوف 2 امرا اساسيا لعلاج المرضى في الوقت المناسب والحد من انتشار جائحه كوفيد 19 نبدا فعاليات اليوم بحديث شيق لدكتوره جاكي واي زميله اول في ستار مسؤوله عن مختبر نانو بايو ومؤسسه سيل باي برايفت ليميتد عن التقنيات المختلفه المتاحه حاليا لتشخيص كوفيد 19 وكيف وكيفيه تطبيقها مدة الحديث 30 دقيقة ويمكننا الإجابة على جميع الأسئلة خلال الخمس دقائق الأخيرة. أيضا أود التنبيه أن هذه الجلسة ستتوفر مع ترجمة فورية وعلى مستمعينا إذا أردت الترجمة الضغط على أيقونة الترجمة على أقصى يمين أسفل الشاشة واختيار القناة الصوتية الثانية اللغة الفرنسية وستقوم بسماع الترجمة الأوتوماتيكية من مترجمنا الفوري الدكتور محمد أبو العلا. Effective detection of SARS-CoV-2 is key to the timely treatment of patients and to limit the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. We would start today's events with an interesting talk by Dr. Jackie Waiying, a star senior fellow who is in charge of the Nanobi lab and the founder of Cell Bay Private Limited about the different technologies currently available for the diagnosis of COVID-19 and how they are applied. Duration of the talk is 30 minutes, and we will have the chance to answer all the questions in the last uh, five minutes. Also, I'd like to note that this session will be available with simultaneous interpretation. And for our attendees, please, if you want to hear the Arabic interpretation, click on the translation icon on the, uh, the far right bottom of the screen and choose the second audio channel, French language. And you will hear the automatic interpretation from our interpreter, Dr. Muhammad Abu Laila. Great. Thank you for the intro. Shall I start? Assalamu alaikum. This is uh, Professor Jackie Ying. I'm at the Nanobio Lab in Singapore. And today I'm really delighted to speak to you about technologies for diagnostics for COVID 19. Okay. So COVID-19 is a coronavirus that can be transmitted. Uh, first, we believe it comes from the host, which is a bat, and then it goes through some intermediate host, which could be pangolin, and then to human, and from human, it can spread to other humans. Okay. So the coronavirus can cause various diseases in both human and animals. And in particular, I think you have heard of SARS, MERS, and now the SARS-CoV-2. And here we talk about major um, pneumonia symptoms that could be due to replicating the virus from the lower respiratory tract. This is a picture of the coronavirus. Because it has all these spiky things, uh, it looks like the crown, and that's why it got its name, coronavirus. It is about 65 to 125 nanometers in diameters. Okay. And it is 79% similar to SARS okay, and 98% similar to the bat coronavirus. And this is why we believe it comes from the bat. The coronavirus contains um, a different components. Shown here is a cross section of the uh, coronavirus. Um, it contains basically what we call the spike glycoprotein or protein S. And it also has an envelope protein on the outside. 
And in the inside, in the core of the virus, is where we see the RNA and the nuclear capsid end proteins. Okay. So these different proteins are very important. The spike protein is responsible for the attachment of the coronavirus to the host cell, for example, human. Okay. And it enters humans through these spike proteins. The transmission of SARS-CoV-2 is illustrated here. We believe that it transmitted primarily by respiratory droplets, and it could also possibly transfer um, through the air. It could be airborne. Okay? It can also be spread by contact when one person touches another person and then touches uh, the face. So basically, we believe that it takes about four to five days before the symptom will start. And after that, the person will have symptoms uh, should be uh, within the 11.5 days. There are people we know that carries the virus but has very, very mild symptoms or have even no symptoms. Okay? And the symptoms are very common, uh, like fever and dry cough. So it's difficult to tell apart from a lot of other viruses. The diagnosis of a SARS-CoV-2 basically is a major problem um, because the virus has caused a major social, economic, and healthcare burden globally. If we want to curb the spread of SARS-CoV-2, it is important to be able to figure out who is infected and we try to segregate them from the people who are healthy. The first genome sequence that has been um, published came up in January 2020. And since then, it allows us to develop diagnostics that are based on RT-PCR. This is real-time reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. And what this assay does, what this test does, is that it will zoom in the part of the SARS-CoV-2 genome that is unique of this virus and then amplify that particular uh, gene. And if it gets amplified, that means it is present, then we know this person is carrying the SARS-CoV-2. Okay. Right now, the RT-PCR is the most sensitive and specific and preferred test for diagnosis. When we want to design the appropriate gene for the diagnosis in RT-PCR, what we want to make sure is that we use the unique part of the SARS-CoV-2 genome that does not overlap with other common viruses such as SARS, MERS, and other coronaviruses, flu, as well as other respiratory uh, diseases. Okay. So this is a very important curve that I would like to share with you. Um, I know it's a little bit busy, but let me explain it. What happens is I want you to focus on the light blue line, which is associated with the virus load from the nasal pharyngeal swab. Nasal pharyngeal swab is a swab that goes all the way to the back of the nose, which is actually just above the throat. Okay, This is where you can twist the swab and then you can collect a good sample. And you can see that when you first um, pick up this virus, you might not have a very high virus load. The virus load will grow as illustrated by the blue line and it will be the highest at, after the onset of the symptoms. And you will remain high within two weeks in the onset of the symptoms. Okay? So this is the best way to detect the virus in the early phase of the infection. Now I want you to look at the two dotted lines. The green dotted line is the IgG antibody and the purple dotted line is the IgM antibody. These are basically a signal that will come up because the antibodies are generated by the human immune system after the person has been infected with the virus. So the body is trying to fight the virus. This IgG and IgM antibodies can be detected through blood sample on a paper-based assay, like what we see in pregnancy test. However, this basic paper-based assay, even though they're very simple and quick and inexpensive, 
are not very accurate because you see, they don't detect the presence of this virus. They are detecting the immune response, which will only come up after 10 days after the onset of the symptoms. So a person could be infected and at the early stage of the infection and shows up as negative on this paper-based assays that is testing for the antibodies. Okay? This is why people like to use the RT-PCR. At the RT-PCR, we can catch a person who is infected at a very early stage. Okay? Besides the nasopharyngeal swab, it is also possible to do a nasal swab or stroke swab. And people also would like to test for sputum and stool. Sputum is a bit difficult because people who are infected with the virus usually have a dry cough instead of a wet cough. Okay? So for the nasopharyngeal swab, you can detect the presence of a virus in the first two, three weeks. Okay? And if you want to be detected by a paper-based assay, you basically need to test for blood samples and it will only work after the body has produced these antibodies. So when seven to 10 days after the onset of the symptoms. Okay? So this is not a good accurate test to catch the virus in the early stage when one is most infectious and should be isolated and treated early. I want to describe assays that has been developed by a spin-off company of our agency. The company's name is Selbay, and he has developed a multiplexed RT-PCR. This multiplexing means that we are detecting two separate genes in the coronavirus at the same time. This is important because it has been shown that no single plex assay, which detect only one part of the gene, can detect all of the different types of SARS-CoV-2. Okay, I want to emphasize that SARS-CoV-2 basically has some mutation and can vary slightly from one region to another. Okay? So the assay that we have designed is on the basis of the molecular evolution patterns of the nuclear acid target sites. We call our multiplex RT-PCR assay TAPAT. TAPAT in Malay means accurate. We have used two different genes in the coronavirus. One is RDRP and one is the M genes. We have developed highly sensitive tests. In fact, all you need is to have about six or 16 copies of the virus in the nasopharyngeal sample, and then you will be able to detect it from the amplification in the RT-PCR. The other thing that we look for is a human gene that is a part of the extraction control to make sure that the assay is running smoothly and correctly. Okay. The thing that is special about our assay is that we were able to design the assay to have 100% identity of all the different SARS-CoV-2 sequences that has been reported as of August 10th. For example, there are 82,000 sequences with 100% homology with both RDRP and M genes that we have developed. Okay, So you can see that of all the gene sequences that have been published, 81,588 will get picked up by both the M gene and the RDRP gene that we have designed for our assay. And then there are 400 sequences detected by the RDRP gene and 105 sequences detected by the M gene. So basically we can see that no matter what kind of system uh, assays, uh, what kind of genome you have, we are able to detect all of them by our method. And this is very important. Now, we also tested the accuracy of our RT-PCR assay with various patient samples. For example, I show you here two patient samples. You need to see the presence of the green curve. The green curve is the internal control that shows you that assay is running properly. Now, if you have this SARS-CoV-2, then you will basically be detected by RDRP, curve, which 
which is blue curve, or the M gene curve, which is the red curve. And you can see these two patients are positive because uh, they carry these two curves. We have also tested many, many uh, human samples that are negative. And in these cases, you can see only the internal control, which is the green curve shows up. You don't see the red curve or the blue curve. Okay, and therefore these people, these 16 human samples that are illustrated here, do not, do not basically um, have the coronavirus infection. We have done many studies. In fact, we have looked at 30 positive samples and 30 negative samples. And we know that our assay is 100% accurate. So it is highly sensitive and highly accurate, but we haven't stopped at that. We decided to develop a very rapid assay that will allow us to detect coronaviruses even faster. We call this an isothermal assay. This isothermal assay is much faster. The RT-PCR assay usually take one and a half to three hours, but our isothermal assay will be much faster because it needs to run at one single temperature instead of going through one temperature up and down in the thermal cycling, which takes a long time. We call our assay CHAPAT. CHAPAT in Malay means rapid. And we have developed this isothermal amplification method that will amplify the RNA of the virus 1 million times within, within 10 minutes. So what we want to do is to illustrate you how this assay is used. Our target gene in this case is an S gene. And each cycle that is illustrated in the x-axis is um, 30 seconds, okay? For a positive patient sample, we see here in a green curve, we can detect it by Chapat in 1.6 minutes instead of normal RT-PCR, which takes one and a half hours, okay? It detects it in 3.3 .3 cycles where the green curve hits the horizontal line. On the other hand, if the patient is negative, it will give you this red curve at 22 cycles, which is equivalent to 11 minutes. Okay? So the pink curve is the control, which will come out at a later time point. What I want to illustrate to you is how fast this assay is. It allows us to get results within basically 10 minutes or so. If positive, we'll pick it up basically within a few minutes. If it's negative, you will know it's negative in about 10 minutes. So we hope this assay, this extremely rapid assay, will make a difference by basically allowing us to detect the diagnosis of whether somebody is infected very quickly. And this will help us basically be able to do more tests quickly and hopefully also inexpensively. We are in the process of developing this test for using saliva. And saliva will basically be much easier to take as a sample, less invasive than a nasopharyngeal swab. Also the survival sample, we have the possibility of making the reagent in such a way that it doesn't have to go through what is called the RNA extraction from within the virus. This is important because it will save us another 30 minutes to one and a half hours which is required for RNA extraction. Thank you very much for your attention. Will the audience have a chance to ask questions? I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, yes, Dr. Jackie, uh, you have yes. the, Q, the Q&A box, box um, yes. below. You can check it for, uh, for questions and you may answer it live. Ah, I see. Ah, I will need somebody to interpret for me. Unfortunately, my my Arabic is not very good. I only can read the Quran, but I don't really understand it. Okay, no problem. Yeah. 
que se abrir. Can you translate um, we, it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, we we only have one question from mm. uh, uh, from Osama. He's asking yes. if the symptoms uh, would uh, would extend over uh, a period of seven to ten days. Would the uh, uh, would the patient would uh, uh, expand beyond the 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 uh, the risky period of, of uh, uh, transmitting the infection to other patients? Mm. Okay, so if we look back at the, the data, what we can see is that although the virus load dropped, okay, this person still might have some viruses that are alive. So it's very difficult to say um, when will they stop being infectious. But one thing is very clear. Um, the viral load might be dropping, but the body might not necessarily be recovering. In fact, what has been seen is this virus basically creates a major problem because the human body has this immune response that really overreacts, I would say overreacts with the presence of this virus. And as a result, it causes a lot of other problems, not just pneumonia. We see that people are dying because of clotting, um, blood clots forming, and many other diseases. And this is because uh, human response um, from the immune system is so violent to this uh, coronavirus. And some people have also asked me, why wouldn't the bats get sick? Because the bats have very different immune system. And also we noticed that the young children who don't have a fully developed human uh, immune response, they could be carrying very high virus load, but they have very minor symptoms. Okay, so this is because they don't have a fully developed immune system. So for adults, um, the immune response will be very strong. And then for old people and also for people who have other diseases like heart problem or diabetes, their immune system is also compromised. So they tend to react very badly to the SARS-CoV-2, and they are very prone to fatalities. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have another question from uh, Mohammed. Uh, uh, Dr. Jackie, um, there's yes. another question that says, uh, why we do not need to do RNA extraction in the isothermal amplification? Okay, it's because we have the possibility of changing the reaction mixture so that we can collect the saliva and directly use it. Usually in saliva, there are certain proteinaceous substances and they can cause what we call inhibitory effects on the normal assay, which means that your assay is greatly compromised in sensitivity. But if we can accommodate these different ingredients inside the saliva sample, then our assay will not be compromising sensitivity. Okay, that will then allow us to use the sample directly. And this is called a direct PCR. And this is what we are working on. Okay, I should also mention because it is so easy to um, get infected, I will really encourage people to wear a mask whenever they are, um, when they, whenever they are outside and whenever they are meeting people and always wash your hands frequently because um, the surfaces might have uh, viruses attached to them. Thank you. Uh, okay, the next uh, question says, what type of isothermal amplification did you use? We have a very special amplification method that is newly developed. It is unlike um, other amplification methods. Okay. So these are the different isothermal amplification methods that are out there. Usually what you see is that they use uh, LAMP and CRISPR. Um, they are quite fast and uh, Abbott ID now is very fast. But ID now also has very low specificity. Okay, so it has a very high false negative. And we are working on our system so that it has 
very high specificity and sensitivity. And we can also work with a large number of samples like in a 96 well plate, unlike Abbott, which is basically using a sample at a time. Okay. And most importantly, we, we want to be fast as well as accurate. Okay, so this is a very different method than what has been published so far. It is only newly patterned uh, a, a few months ago. Okay, the next uh, question is, how do we know if the infected person is not contagious anymore? Is the end of symptoms enough to decide or it needs a special test to, uh, to know? Yes. Unfortunately, the, the, you, you can't tell whether the person is infectious because if the person um, still has a virus, even though the viruses are dead, um, they will still get picked up by the RT-PCR. RT-PCR can pick up dead viruses, uh, which is no longer infectious. Right? So um, what people usually do is they allow a person to leave the hospital if the person um, basically has shown that they don't have symptoms and that their immune response, uh, the antibody has come up. Okay, so this is the thing. Um, it is a, a difficult thing to call uh, because sometimes when people are uh, let out of the hospital, they can still pass away at home because something suddenly can happen. So this is the part that is very difficult to say about this this new disease that uh, people are still trying to find out more. Okay. So yeah, unfortunately, uh, it is difficult to say conclusively whether somebody is contagious or not. Yeah. So the best is they have passed the RT-PCR test. Yeah. Okay, the next question says, uh, is there any relation between coronavirus and vitamin D? You know, interestingly, I was just reading that uh, some hospitals in Singapore, people are encouraged the use of D3 and B12. D3 and B12, um, for, it seems to really help in the treatment of the patients. So, um, but what is very clear is in Singapore, we have very few cases of, of death uh, associated with the virus, even though we have a very large number of uh, infection cases, um, many of, most of them, I would say, associated with a lot of the foreign workers that we have in Singapore who are isolated in the dormitories. Um, the reason why we have so few cases of fatality, I think, has to do with the fact that people are very conscientious. We had uh, experienced SARS about 17 years ago, and so people are aware that this kind of infectious disease are, are really very deadly, and the hospital knows how to handle those. Um, so very few people uh, working in the hospital um, got infected. Okay, they are wearing the PPE, and uh, people tend to seek treatment very early. If they have symptoms, they will see doctors very quickly. And if the symptom persists, for example, fever, etc., then uh, they will send to do a nasal pharyngeal swab to see whether uh, they have. Uh, uh, basically being infected. So this is very important. Very often people don't seek treatment early enough. And by the time they go to see the doctors um, in many other countries, they are already so sick and the immune response has overreacted and it's very, very difficult to, to help them. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, the next question says, um... It's about the, the isothermal RT-PCR. Is it possible to be used to test air samples in future? Is it able to use to test air samples? Okay. So the, okay, the isothermal method is not called RT-PCR. The isothermal method is a completely different amplification. RT-PCR is uh, associated with thermal cycle. Okay. So yes, the isothermal method is very sensitive, but yet for air samples, it will be very difficult to collect because um, the viral load could be very, very uh, low. Yeah, but it is something that I think uh, people will continue to see whether it will be possible. Um, for example, one might be able to do some swaps on surfaces uh, in a room to see whether um, these viruses 
have been there because they do settle uh, on surfaces after a certain period of time. Okay. Yeah. And okay. also in many countries, they are testing water and switch because they do tend if people um, do have a, a large number of people who are infected, it will go into, it will go into the stool and go into the sewage. Yeah. So that's a good surveillance too as well. Okay, uh, the next question is, uh, the last one actually, um, he's asking if 15 minutes is short for the enzyme to work, are you sure it's not primer? I don't know. Are you sure it is not? We have developed an enzyme that is very, very powerful that allows us to do this amplification very, very rapidly. It is different from the normal RT-PCR, okay? Our normal RT-PCR has two enzymes. We have four enzymes and they do different things in this reaction. So it's very different from the normal assays. And I think the results show for itself that uh, it works. And uh, we have done repeated studies. And of course, we are still refining these studies. That's why uh, we haven't basically develop it uh, for commercial applications yet, but it is something that we are busy uh, developing and we hope that it will be available in a couple of months. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Jackie. That's uh, That sure. was the last question, actually. I thank you so much for the session thank you. and for your uh, answering uh, the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Salam alaikum. Uh, may Allah bless us uh, to be healthy throughout this uh, pandemic period.